thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I haven't been here in Russia for a few decades. Uh, and you are probably wondering why I have this on. Ja nie gawariu po ruski, ja pani maju. So I can find out how you are doing on. Uh, and, and then you get a grade. If you did fine, you get chocolate. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, as I said, for being here. And I, I always start with apologizing. Uh, uh, reason is I have a different style than most people are used to. And... Uh, we call it in English a quiet taste. So uh, those who heard me before, you have no excuse if you are still here. But those who didn't, uh, I apologize. Uh, I do things different from other people and I try to understand the reasons behind development. So, some of it goes back to my academic career, and I hope you will forgive me. The good news is there's no exam at the end. You will all pass. So in this class, you will all do fine. Uh, in general, I want to talk about some theoretical relationships, about the present reality, where are we now, uh, and a little about the future. Uh, starting with theoretical relationships, the question is, can we predict things in aviation? It's a fast-moving industry. Can we actually predict the future? And the answer is yes. The causalities, relationships, are still very good. They are strong. You can use statistics, econometrics, you can explain why things are happening. And if you think about it, why is it important? If you don't feel well uh, and you go to a doctor and the doctor tells you, uh, take some tests and says, you have strep, here's some medicine, you immediately feel better because you know the reason why you don't feel well. You know that next day you'll do fine. If on the other hand, the doctor says, I have no idea, let's not shake hands, <laughs> please send me the check, uh, different story. In aviation, we know why things are happening. Now, somebody will say, wait a second, could you have predicted 9-11? No, of course not, because unpredictable events, by definition, cannot be predicted. That's why they are called unpredictable events. But the important thing is the consequences can be predicted. And this is really important. So in planning, when there is some development you didn't plan on, with the causalities that we have, you will be able to continue your business. Uh, here's an example. When 9-11 happened, uh, let's go back. When 9-11 happened, I was sitting in my office by Dallas Airport, uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, I immediately figured out, I started researching and writing a note to our customers because I knew that, of course, a big event happened. It will have tremendous impact on demand for aircraft, on values. But how can we predict it? So I said, you know what, let's go back. This is traffic in 1986 on the North Atlantic. And you can see, for those on this side, the others, uh, you are, this is business class, no, economy. Uh, you can see that there was immediate drop of about 30%, and it took about a year to, to come back. Uh, now, what happened in 86? Uh, anybody remembers? 
Uh, no, not Lockerbie. No, no, uh, you guys can take some credit. Uh, chicken Kiev? Chernobyl. Uh, you had Chernobyl and you had some terrorism uh, and, and US attack on Libya. So basically, people were afraid to fly because they said, I don't want to go to Europe because I'll either be blown up or I'll come back glowing in the dark. And both of them are not good for tourists. Uh, so I said, OK, this was 86. How about 91? This was the uh, US attack on Iraq. And everybody was afraid to fly. And I remember at that time I lived in Los Angeles. I was flying to Washington, DC, and my housekeeper said, you can't go because what happens if you die? Well, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I said, you'll have to raise my children. But, uh, but um, why would she be concerned? Everybody was concerned. So again, notice what happened, very similar pattern. So I predicted that the same thing will happen after 9-11. Uh, and look what happened. Again, very similar pattern. Now, how come it didn't come up here? What was this? This is another, SARS. So yes. We can explain even such big events. OK, so we do know that the industry is cyclical, and we believe it's predictable. And the question is, where are we in this cycle now? And it's fairly obvious we are someplace on top, as Brother Sergey uh, explained. Um, uh, as an economist, I have to show some equations. So here is the relationship of world traffic and world economy. And if you look at this, f forget the econometrics. Those who took econometrics understand it. Those who don't, it doesn't matter. But the fact is that this is world traffic. If world economy goes up 1%, world traffic goes up about 1.9%. OK? Why is it? Because flying is a luxury product. We, don't, we have to eat. We don't have to fly. We make more money. We spend more on flying. Uh, and notice, and uh, one of them is the model, and you can see that the relationship, the model explains over 99% of historical variability, which is phenomenal. Why is this important? It may not be important to one airline in one country, because there are many things that affect them. Uh, the other people, uh, political developments in their country, volcanoes, many things can happen. But for the leasing industry and for manufacturing, this is really critical because it means as long as world economy will grow, there will be more demand for aircraft, which is good in case you missed it. Uh, OK, and this is the same thing when we look at growth rates. And this is traffic and economy. And you can see it's kind of double. We just double the number, and they look very similar. And the last point, and I will come back to this chart. This shows patterns of uh, deliveries and orders of aircraft. And again, you can see there are cyclical developments that can be predicted. And you also can see the last few years, things are fairly good. Uh, OK. So in general, again, theoretically, we need to look into demand supply predictions. And to do it, we look at outside factors, exogenous factors, uh, which is the economy. 
uh, we, the <coughs> excuse me, we the industry don't determine the economy, it's like the weather outside, we li live with it, but we know that it has tremendous impact on us. Fuel prices, again, we don't determine them, but it has tremendous impact on how many planes are bought, what kind of planes are produced, technology, politics, all of these are very important factors that we have to think about when we try to predict the future. A uh, really important point that most people kind of try to forget. Uh, we have stable relationships and sometimes we have unexpected, unpredictable events. But sometimes, uh, sometimes we have, we deviate from the relationships for a certain period. And I think this is where we are now and I want to talk about this a little bit. So what are the relevant variables we, we try to use in analysis? Traffic, which is driven by economy. Yields, meaning how much do airlines make per passenger? How much money do airlines make? And uh, Brother Sergey mentioned that they are really making a lot of money and they are very happy. Uh, how many planes are produced? And again, if we believe manufacturers, they are going up and up. Uh, how many planes are retired now that oil prices came down? Less aircraft are retired, which means there's a bigger stock of aircraft. So all this determines a relationship of demand and supply, and this determines the values of aircraft, and that's what we Avitas do for a living. Uh, you've seen this before, and you can see that here you have a period of a really, really, really big orders. And some people, uh, manufacturers especially, are not concerned because they say that's orders, that's not deliveries. Uh, so everybody says, I think we will kill the rest of the time until lunch because that's a very nice song. It's a really kitschy, but... Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, as I said, I have it on a loop. I like it. It's a bad song, but uh, okay. So everything is awesome, right? Uh, the stock market in the U.S. is doing great, all-time high, huge growth. Uh, airlines are making phenomenal profits, as pointed out. World economies are fine. There is no problem. In the U.S., we are two months away from becoming the second longest expansion in U.S. history. Since 1854, they were... 34 cycles, this will be the second longest expansion. This is, we are doing really well. Everything is awesome. Uh, in aviation, same thing. Record profits, record backlogs, and number of industry leaders said forget this cyclicality. It no longer exists. So it started with John Leahy of Airbus, who sold more aircraft than anybody in human uh, history. Uh, now the, the chairman, uh, Dennis, uh, of uh, Boeing said a similar thing. Doug Parker of American Airlines almost is becoming a missionary, a, a religious leader. We have new people, new realities. We will never fail again. I like Doug, and he has an element of a, of a preacher, but he's now preaching. So people are beginning to really say, yeah, everything is awesome, and it will be forever. Uh, and if we look at this here, you can see this is backlog, and it used to be about twice production, and now it's about, you know, it. it takes about 10 years for you to get to burn off uh, the backlog. So 
wow, this is phenomenal. Again, manufacturers will say, don't worry, your pretty little head. That's when they talk to me. Uh, and they say, don't worry, be happy. Uh, we are just selling, it doesn't mean we are delivering. This is not the pattern of deliveries. Well, here is deliveries, which are, yes, they are much more stable than orders, correct? Can we go there? Yeah, delivery is much more stable than orders. However, let's look just at deliveries. Forget orders, just deliveries. And we have a pattern here. Deliveries never become negative, of course. Orders can be negative. But they go up, then come down. And the periods are 7 to 11 years. OK? Up and down, up and down, up and down. Make sense? Where are we now? We are now 13 years of only up. We didn't start coming down yet. This is um, either awesome if you are a manufacturer or leasing company, or it's a little scary. Uh, so what is the explanation for the mother of all cycles? Well, there were reasons for it. There are good reasons that we understand. We had a period of high oil prices. When oil prices are high, airlines want to buy new aircraft because the operating cost of an, airline, of an airliner became 40% was fuel versus before maybe 10, 15%. Uh, well, they shouldn't have bought all this stuff, in my opinion, because I was predicting that oil prices will come down. However, that's what happened. Also, low interest rate. When money is free, people are willing to buy. And when there are record profits in the US, on Wall Street, and many companies make a lot of money, they have money to invest. And again, quoting Brother Sergey, uh, aviation is a sexy industry, so that's where you invest. No, it was Brother Igor. Oh, Brother Igor, you guys look alike. It's the <laughs> hairstyle. Um, it's a good hairstyle. Okay. No, we, we, we do, Adam, we're different. We're like brothers, but one is smart, one is beautiful. Still arguing. <laughs> okay. This, 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 the smart and the beautiful, okay. Uh, we also, because the high oil prices, we had new engines and new aircraft being produced, and because of this, people buy new aircraft, okay? So you also had new players, and these were, you have new airlines, you have many LCCs that suddenly can get a whole bunch of aircraft from the new lessors. You have new lessors, and Sergey's presentation was showing it, and I'll show you, uh, for example, Chinese lessors suddenly come in, they have planes, and Middle East, and uh, new manufacturers. Now, the big change is that, that number of these new players were Middle East and China. And the reason I'm pointing it out is they are not always driven by standard economic rationale. And that's a really important point. So uh, going back, remember this chart? Uh, okay. If, if I do it simpler, if I just look every year at percent growth of traffic divided by percent growth of the economy. We get a relationship which we kind of predict around two, but the, the trend has been going down over the many years. And the reason for it is 
the, the industry is becoming more mature. However, look at the period last few years here. Okay? The last few years, suddenly things are up. And yes, traffic grew 7%. Look at long-term forecasts of Boeing, Airbus, uh, Bombardier, Embraer, everybody. Their forecasts are less than 5%. Last few years, we had 7%. How can that be? Is there a new reality, really? Or are we just fooling ourselves? And again, putting it together, there are more aircraft available, and a number of them are financed by new players. Uh, many of these players don't have to respond to standard economic rationale. You have more airlines, more or less uh, LCCs being supplied to aircraft. We have more traffic. Now, I'm beginning to think that this is a little scary. I remember the song, Police. I'm afraid that I'll be struck by lightning, so don't stand so close to me. <laughs> I know it's sacrilege for me to say, but Maybe we have too many aircraft. Maybe we produce many aircraft, we give them to people at, at low rates, and that's why traffic goes up. So if we have a bubble, how could it burst? Because usually bubbles, by definition, are irrational. And if they are irrational, we cannot predict how they will burst because they were created irrationally. And the only answer is they'll burst irrationally. But in this case, I think we can see the reasons why we have this buildup. So I can think of four ways. The traditional way, interest rate rise, China and uh, Middle East. And starting the traditional way, uh, I mean, this is old-fashioned uh, economic recession. Right now, things are good. Now, in the U.S., we are pushing the economy. We, we increased our deficit 30% when the economy is at full employment. That's crazy. Every economist will tell you this is really crazy. Luckily, we have a leader who doesn't have to listen to economists, so uh, everything is awesome. But that means that we are kind of inflating things. Uh, the second, historically, the traditional way is where you make policy mistakes, like a trade war. But again, we know that trade wars cannot happen because we are very reasonable leaders. And something like this couldn't happen. Yeah, sarcasm, another one of the services I provide. Uh, okay, uh, so this was one. The second is interest rates. Interest rates, every economist believes, eventually will go up. I predict many things. I don't predict interest rates. So I can't say I was wrong, but we don't know the timing, but if it happens, and for example, everybody says interest rates will go up, that could affect many lessors, many airlines, many people who financed short-term, very low rates, uh, long-term assets at very, very short-term low rates. When interest rate goes up, I know number of lessors, I know number of airlines that will immediately go out of business. Okay. Now, China, uh, it's a place far away, no, uh, closer to you actually. Uh, uh, this, uh, th they had a very important election uh, in, uh, in October. This is Xi Jinping, uh, the great leader. 
And uh, as much as we don't follow, their elections are different. They are not maybe, not everybody votes, but the important people vote. And uh, it is really important to watch what's happening there. And there were a number of big changes uh, that, again, most people don't realize. Wang Qishan, who basically was number two uh, of the set seven uh, members of the standing committee of the Politburo, uh, who used to be governor of Hainan, uh, is no longer in this position. He's now the vice president. Uh, Li Keqiang, who is the, and I, I uh, Apologize to the real Chinese speakers. Uh, I, I know. I pronounce it like an American, so I apologize for, for mispronunciation. But for example, Liu He is, is a new economic person who is much closer to Xi Jinping, who probably will do most of the things that the prime minister does. All of these are really important developments that most of us don't pay attention to. Why am I stressing it? Because the Chinese, China changed its policy regarding lessors because of political reasons. It could go one way or another for political reasons. They, that's why it's important not so much to follow Chinese economy, but follow Chinese political developments. Uh, and look at Chinese lessors. Uh, decade ago, they almost didn't exist. Now, uh, forget Bank of China because they were really a Singapore entity. Quarter of, of airplanes in the top 20 lessors, even higher when you look at value, even higher in terms of orders. I mean, it's over 8% of world fleet. It's, it's a couple thousand planes. I mean, these are big numbers, and this happened all of a sudden. And I wish them all success, but it's, when we are talking about if things go another way, if they could, that would clearly cause a big meltdown. Uh, the other thing is uh, Middle East. Middle East, when you look at Qatar, Abu Dhabi, and Dubai, Together, these three countries, even with slaves, I mean, in terms of citizens, that's maybe half a million people. If you are not slaves, expats, sorry, that's the right term. If you put all the expats, all the real workers there, uh, you are adding, you have maybe five million people, okay? Five million people that's, that wouldn't make the top 100 cities in China. They have about 30% of, of white body backlog in the world. They bought huge amounts. And again, why? Because it's a political decision by their leadership. So I'm claiming that all this is highly related to oil prices. These are oil prices you see OPEC 1, OPEC 2, they went from nothing to having about 10% of world uh, wide body uh, uh, aircraft. Okay, here, went up. Then you see a long period oil prices stable. They didn't buy that many. Same here. Then oil prices went up. Suddenly they started buying huge amounts. Uh, will they take all the triple seven X's? No way. No way will this happen. And again, if things start unraveling in the Middle East, that could cause some bigger problems. Uh, this, I, I'm fooling you because there's another section. It's a short section, but don't get too excited. Oh, it's over. Uh, so summary. Uh, present situation feels better than it is really warranted. It, it feels good, everything is awesome, I'm not complaining. Uh, okay. 
we can find at least four ways that the good situation can burst. Uh, we have a lot of short-term political uncertainties right now around the world. Uh, some involve developments that your country is related to, some most are caused by my country. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't have elected Trump. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, but, but all of these are additional pressures. In the long term, I still am very upbeat about aviation. Aviation is good. Aviation continues growing. They are all the good factors. So I, I, I'm not saying things are really bad. We should worry. I'm, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying uh, and, and, you know, when people say, look at all the developments, there's still growth in China, there's a lot of growth in India, there's, yes, all of this is good, but right now the situation is a little too good, and I think a number of these planes that people are getting will not be placed. Now, talking about the future, and I, I know uh, this will be a little surprising to you. I, I started looking uh, into, and, and this is for ISTED presentation in, in uh, San Diego, I, I, I started looking into wide body aircraft, and I, I know this is the future, no. Maxim Gorky. Uh, that was a plane, uh, Tupolev uh, plane, many, many years ago. Now. Russia was at the forefront of aviation. This plane was carrying 72 passengers. I mean, think about it, at that time. It had a whole bunch of sleeper suites. It, it had a bar, buffet, movie theater, laundry, pharmacy, printing press. So you could have... Uh, Mr. Stalin's uh, books printed uh, while you fly and you are in the, uh, in the bar uh, getting drunk. I mean, all of this was good. It actually flew in 34, okay? Now, there was another plane that I thought it looked stranger, I again, talking about the Russian uh, stuff. Uh, Kalinin, anybody remembers this plane? Now, uh, first flight in uh, 33, I remember it well. <laughs> that was the first time I retired. Um, it was planned for 120 passengers. There wasn't a second flight because Tupolev named the plane Maxim Gorky, so Stalin kind of liked it. Uh, Kalinin, uh, yeah, Yosip didn't like him too much, so he was executed, so we, we didn't have a continuation of the flights. But overall, this is aviation, okay? It's basket of puppies, sunshine, uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, cute little animals. Uh, I, I know that people who know me will say, Adam, uh, we don't believe you. Your heart really isn't in it because uh, you don't care that much about puppies. Okay, so aviation is like a box of chocolates. I should, I'm a chocoholic, so I always wanted to be an alcoholic, but I don't like alcohol too much, so became a chocoholic. Uh, but... Um, Everything is awesome. Everything is good in the long term. And I do hope that Russia will start, you are beginning with the uh, uh, airplanes, the uh, MS-21, and I hope that you will 
come back to your glorious history, and uh, that includes airlines and leasing companies. Uh, I'm ready to take, actually that's his, Igor will tell you, but I'll be here all day, so if somebody wants to talk to me later, feel free, same price, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Uh, Adam, thank you so much. Gentlemen, ladies. Я, я говорю, это легенда. И, пожалуйста, вопросы, questions, please. I, I, I don't believe. I don't believe. No. Adam, well, thanks. This, this was great. But uh, where is your heart and your gut feeling for the next three, four years? Are you with this uh, preacher guy, the CEO of what, American Airlines, whatever? No. Or you, your gut feeling is... Uh, on, uh, how to say, more reasonable path, or more uh, well, down to earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, um, Sergey, that, that was very unfair because you're pushing me, uh, you're giving me the answer, are you stupid or are you smart? Uh, no, however, my, my independent opinion, uh, regardless of, of, of this, is I think we produce too many planes. I have, I think we have too many planes. I, I think we have too much traffic right now. Traffic is good, everything is good, but right now I think this is not sustainable and it will have to end. And the only question is how will it end? How fast will it end? Again, uh, it doesn't mean it's the end of aviation, but we live in a too happy time uh, in aviation, and uh, there isn't the economic realities owned behind it, and some of it is because we have, as I said, new players who are not necessarily driven by economic realities. Nothing wrong. We, we shouldn't tell other people how to live their life, but the same way that it gets on, it can turn, get turned off. In the Middle East, it's very obvious that right now it's being turned off, and, and it will happen fairly soon. Now, one last point. I, 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 you know, people are criticizing uh, Boeing, Airbus, and so on, Bombardier, others. Uh, you, you guys are not there yet in production, so soon when you'll start producing hundreds of planes a year. Uh, but uh, as if they are doing a bad thing selling planes. And the point is, manufacturers are not your mother. They are not here to tell you, you shouldn't buy the plane, okay? Their job is to sell planes. When you go to a restaurant and you want to buy, at the end, chocolate dessert, uh, the waiter will not tell you, uh-uh, you shouldn't have it, chubby, <laughs> you shouldn't do it, uh, only if you run around the block five times and then maybe fruit salad. Uh, that's not their job. Boeing's job is not to tell you not to buy planes. If people want to do it, if the circumstances are for them to buy, Boeing will produce. Uh, Airbus will produce. B by the way, what will happen if things come down? Boeing at one time cut 30,000 people. Uh, Airbus now produces planes in China, US. Uh, Germany? Uh, uh, yeah, no, no. Germany, France is real for them. Okay? They cannot lay people off there. But they don't care about laying people off in China or in the US. That's why they are starting to produce more planes in other places, because there they can cut production, okay? At home, they cannot. And, and you know, as everybody says, oh, that's a good sign that they move internationally. They're doing it because this way they can control production. If they want to cut, yeah, I don't care that Chinese or, or American workers are unemployed. Sucks for them. They don't have the rights that good Europeans have.
У нас есть еще вопрос. Адам, Юрий, не узнал тебя с Усаби. Что слышно? You mentioned MS21. Um, what do you think about the um, white bodies? Uh, is there a place on the market globally for um, Russian-made or Chinese-made a newcomer in, on, on the, in the white bodies uh, segment? Okay, again, I, I'll show, uh, I express an opinion uh, that is my opinion, but a uh, number of people will not like it. Uh, the uh, CR whatever, the, the new plane, not the 919, it's a continuation, and th there is talk about China and Russia producing the plane together. I think that it doesn't make any sense. I think that the chance that this will happen is probably as big as me being in the Olympics as a champion boxer, uh, and uh, even the name, I mean, the Chinese decided to call it 929, and, and the Russians were, wait a second. Uh, um, so then they, they changed it to CR for China, Russia, 929. Uh, the Chinese have no reason to do it. I think the Russians believe that they have a history going back to, to pull off and, you know, big planes. And they hope that the Chinese have a big market and a lot of money. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> I wish you all the best. They, they will sign various memorandum and, and, you know, letters of understanding and, and so on. We called it letters of enthusiasm. Uh, it's not going to happen. There is no real reason for these two countries, these two manufacturers to cooperate. Um, uh, Russia has to get the MS-21 flying, doing well. China with the 919 still has problems. The ARJ-21 is a big disaster that they have to fix. They can't concentrate now on the now, in 20 years, that's a different story. See me in 20 years, you'll probably be retired, I'll still be here, but, uh, but in the meantime, no chance, my biased view. Друзья, я волевым решением, извините, прерываю нашу Q&A с Адамом. Ну, и напоминаю, Адам сегодня целый день здесь, он с удовольствием, это я передаю его собственные слова, с удовольствием пообщается с, с с авиакомпаниями, с российскими, с другими участниками авиационного рынка. И я настоятельно рекомендую это делать. Прислушайтесь словам этого человека. Он предсказал падение цен на нефть и на авиационное топливо в 2011 году.